Nicholas Trist to Secretary of State John Forsyth, December 9th, 1839. A foreigner who feels himself inconvenienced or fancies himself aggrieved in any way, either by a difficulty with another individual or by the operation of the laws, is apt to fancy that he is but to call upon the Council for Protection, as it is termed and that thereupon the waving of the consular wand will suspend the actions of the government and set everything to rights. The extent of which this fallacy prevails is altogether inconceivable, except to one who has filled the post of consul at a place frequented as Havana is by his countrymen. Nicholas Trist sent this letter back to the Secretary of State near the end of his time as consul. On paper, Trist looked like an ideal consul, well-connected, well-versed in the law, familiar with the concerns of American merchants, though he wasn't a merchant himself. In reality, his beliefs about the world, combined with his abrasive personality, set him up for failure again and again and again. Looking back on some of Trist's actions, though, we might actually kind of want him to fail. I'm Abby Mullen, and in this episode of Consolation Prize, we're going to Havana, Cuba. Cuba turns up in the news with some regularity these days. I just signed, prior to walking in, an order directing Secretary Mattis, who is doing a great job. Thank you. Like here in 2017. To re-examine our military detention policy and to keep open the detention facilities in Guantanamo Bay. But the United States has a much longer history with Cuba, though it's probably not any more edifying. When we talk about American relations with Cuba in the early 19th century, one word has to dominate. Slavery. The story of Nicholas Trist in Havana intersects with slavery at many places. He made a lot of enemies because he defended the little guys, the common sailors, against their greedy and cruel captains. But his sympathies didn't extend to the most vulnerable and oppressed. In fact, we'll talk about the ways he might have made it possible to enslave more black people. But before we talk about Trist's actions, we need to understand a bit about Havana. So, let's set the scene. What's Havana like when Trist arrives? When Trist arrived in 1834, Cuba was one of the last holdouts of the Spanish Empire, one of its last remaining colonies in the Caribbean. Mexico and other Latin American colonies had declared their independence, but Spain had managed to hold on to Cuba, for the moment. But they didn't have a strong grasp on the port of Havana. Matthew Rafferty, who's writing a book about Nicholas Trist, sees Havana as... The place where Americans came to make a lot of money without having to pay a ton of attention to the regulation. That the government was either not sufficiently competent to to see what they were doing, or sufficiently corruptible or complicit to let them do whatever they wanted. And so it was a pretty wild, it was a pretty open town. And those expat American merchants and captains had really established uh, themselves with a lot of power and economic control prior to, to Trist's arrival. In one artist's illustration of Havana from 1830, we can see a broad avenue. Kind of like the fancy parts of Europe, though with palm trees in the background rather than elms or pines. You can almost hear the clopping of the horses' hooves as they trot down the avenue, pulling gilded carriages with elegant ladies wearing enormous plumed hats. These fine ladies and their gentlemen are clearly of European descent. They could be from all over Europe or the United States. Merchants might move to Havana from Great Britain... France, Spain, the United States, and even countries like Denmark. Some of the well-to-do men ride on horseback through the plaza, on horses with ornately decorated manes and tails. The Spanish soldiers are standing nearby, talking to the merchants. 
I've always wondered why white was the color of choice for formal military attire, given the large dust clouds in this illustration. We also can't see the sweat that's undoubtedly soaking through the fancy clothing that all of these gentry are wearing in this tropical climate. But all in all, it seems like a very fine place to be if you have wealth to display. But there are parts of this illustration that hint at the complexities of a city like Havana. All the people on horseback or in carriages are white. They don't even seem to notice the black people walking by them, shackled, carrying heavy loads ahead of an overseer's whip. Slavery is the backbone of Havana society that's present, but largely being ignored in this etching. We'll talk more about the enslaved people in a little bit. But there's one more group of people that seem to be ignored also. Sitting over in the shadows, watching the parade of wealthy merchants go by, are a few sailors. The good life for merchants did not translate into the good life for sailors. Their Havana looked nothing like this. I can't definitely say that Havana was like Tortuga from the Pirates of the Caribbean, but I can't say it wasn't like that. There are probably fewer pirates, at least in the 1830s, but there was a lot of scum and villainy. Sailors from all over the world roved the wilder parts of Havana, and sailors weren't exactly known for their genteel manners or kindly dispositions. Yes, of course this is a stereotype, but it does have some truth to it. A pretty significant number of these sailors were American. Havana could be a very dangerous place for all of them. According to William Shaler, who was Trist's predecessor, There is no port in the world where seamen are exposed to so many and such fatal seductions as in Havana. Sure, maybe they saw the prospect of drinking, or women, or gambling, or whatever other vices you can imagine. But Shaler reported that American sailors coming into the port of Havana were treated so badly by their captains that they deserted to get away from the cruelty. So it didn't take much imagination for sailors to see that any life was better away from beatings and harassment. Shaler reported at least one ship where the entire crew deserted when they got to Havana. Shaler and then Trist after him believed that ship's captains were being cruel on purpose, to make the sailors desert. This practice seems kind of counterintuitive. You can't sail a ship without a crew. So why are the captains doing this? And if the captains are being so cruel, why are any sailors staying? The answer is partially a legal matter. The cost of desertion was very steep. A U.S. law passed in 1790 set the penalty. Sailors who deserted before finishing the voyage they contracted for forfeited all their wages, and they could even be obligated to pay for replacing their labor on the voyage. Captains sometimes took advantage of this law and refused to pay wages to the sailors who jumped ship because of the cruelty, even if the captains had been the ones to provoke their desertion. Sailors did know the law, but some also deserted accidentally. Captains and others reported that unscrupulous boarding house owners in Havana also entrapped sailors, getting them so drunk or steeped in gambling debt that they were essentially captives in the port. So sailors who deserted didn't do it on a whim. They needed strong motivation or strong coercion. For Shaler, desertion was a huge problem because he had to represent both sides. On the one hand, captains came to him asking for help in getting their deserters back in order to man their ships, or at least to collect their debts. On the other hand, sailors came to him to ask for help getting their wages, and Shaler tried to help them as much as he could. Sometimes Shaler even had to go find sailors who had fallen into bad hands in the port and rescue them. Sailors could also be cut loose in the port of Havana in a different way. 
The port was extremely busy, but unloading cargoes took a long time. So sailors also had a lot of opportunities to find more lucrative jobs on other ships, especially if the captain they arrived with was slow to pay out. At that point, the sailors could legally break their agreement. Shaler feared that the lag in payout was causing men to sign on to slave ships, which paid well. Shaler died of cholera in Havana. In his place, President Jackson appointed an old friend, Nicholas Trist, and Trist inherited all of Shaler's headaches with these captains and their deserting crews. Trist was a political appointee. He had no connections to Havana or to the merchants that traded there. He went to Havana because he thought that a consulship in Havana would make him rich. Trist is a really kind of complicated, interesting guy. He even looked odd. He was very tall and very thin, well over six feet, well under 200 pounds. Even his enemies, and he had a lot of those, had to acknowledge he was pretty brilliant. Uh, even his friends had to acknowledge he was pretty exhausting. I've never encountered sort of somebody in the archives who wrote more about less um, and with such passion and such anger. This, for instance, is from the letter he wrote reporting on the perversity of the captains and causing their sailors to desert. Sir, the incessant machinations of which this place has been the theater, from the moment almost when I first entered upon the discharge, of the duties of the office have been specially directed of late to the production of new excitement upon the subject of the regulations and force at this port in regards to the shipping of seamen. The manifestations of their success are not to be mistaken, and this will probably soon be displayed on a grand scale in a fresh flood of preposterous misrepresentations and calumny through the press of our country and more memorials to government. That the subject may be at once understood, I now transmit some documents which were designed for use in the report, which has long been my purpose to make. In order that the government... He either would have been fantastic on Twitter or terrible. Being concise was not his thing, but being angry over and over again about minor slights, that's, you know, the real sort of chef's kiss of the tryst ethos. Trist turned up near a lot of famous people and events. If you're thinking, I've heard of this guy before, it may be because he was the negotiator for the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the treaty that ended the U.S.-Mexico War. But that was after this. Trist had been greatness adjacent, as Matt says, his whole life. He studied law with Jefferson. He was a West Point dropout. He ultimately married uh, Jefferson's granddaughter, was at one time or another the personal secretary uh, to three different men who either would be or had been president. He worked with um, Jefferson and then Monroe and then Andrew Jackson. These personal connections didn't help Trist once he got the job. Even before Trist got to Havana, he was being set up for failure. The merchants who held a lot of power in Havana didn't want him, and they made that quite clear. First, they tried to get another person appointed to the position before Trist even arrived. When that didn't pan out, one of the merchants tried to pay Trist off not to take the job. Yeah, the merchants didn't want him for a number of reasons. One, he was not one of them, right? They wanted somebody, and this is something that Trist in his writings complains about at length, they wanted somebody who was really there to serve the interests of this growing American merchant community. They wanted somebody who was one of them. They wanted somebody who would take their word for things, facilitate their business. You know, it's fine if he operates on his own account, but what they got was a Southerner instead of a Northerner, a Democrat instead of a National Republican or Whig, uh, a political appointee instead of somebody with any background or experience in Havana. Given all these differences, it's not surprising that Trist and the merchant communities of Havana would have their disagreements. But Trist's absolute refusal to compromise his sort of idiosyncratic personal sense of honor or the honor of the consulship set him up for a number of showdowns during his tenure as consul. 
there's a philosophical debate about what a consul is supposed to do, whose interests is it supposed to serve. Trist decided that he was there to serve the interests of the common sailors. Because of this, over his term in Havana, Trist accumulated many powerful enemies amongst the New England merchants. They disliked both the work he did against them and also how he went about it. We might also be a little bit surprised and exasperated at the way Trist goes about his job. In particular, I shake my head a bit at Trist's insistence on protocol. Some of his biggest fights were ostensibly about whether he had to go to an American ship to bring paperwork or whether the American captain had to come to him. But I think there's a bigger issue here. Trist felt that he didn't get the proper respect from these captains, and so he took out his irritation in slightly petty fights that blew up. But he also seems to have had a penchant for arresting American captains on the slightest provocation. The most significant case had to do with uh, something that happened on board the Kremlin, um, a vessel out of Boston in 1838, which was captained by uh, a guy named Abraham Wendell Jr. There ends up a dispute between Wendell and his first mate, a guy named Bush. Uh, Wendell is outraged when Trist takes Bush's side. Right? And, and one of the things Trist notes is, as a good uh, Jacksonian, a lot of contradictions here. He's very much a Virginia gentleman and demands to be treated as such, but also he's a good Jacksonian Democrat who believes in the equality of white men. And he argues that he was identified by that merchant community almost immediately as not in their interest, but as a sailor's consul. And that a lot of his problems fall, fall from the fact that he takes the men's complaints seriously. In this particular instance, it sort of snowballs into threats and allegations back and forth and ends with Wendell getting thrown in a Spanish prison uh, in Havana for six months, which ends up a huge scandal. And there are public meetings in Boston and New York and you know, public protests and pamphlets back and forth. Trist described Wendell, he said, one meeting was quite sufficient to make me aware what class of shipmaster he belonged to inasmuch as he took pleasure in speaking of his men in a tone which, if used by a stage driver uh, with respect to his horses, could not fail to fill his passengers with disgust. Like, that's a very Tristian insult. This encounter was just one of many. They weren't just about desertion. Really, in all disputes between captains and sailors, Trist took the sailor's side. Trist's view of himself as a southern gentleman also irritated the captains, who thought that he was putting on an awful lot of airs for someone who loved the common man so much. But there was another problem. Living like a southern gentleman isn't cheap. He imagines that moving to Havana is going to be the thing that kind of secures his fortune uh, in two ways. One, he thinks he's going to make a lot of money as the consul. It was one of the few consuls that did have a salary because it was one of the sort of top tier, most important ones. But even more than that, he thought he was going to make just a ton of money from the fee structure. Um, and he also believed that he was going to make a fortune as a merchant in his own right. Before Trist came to Havana, his friends and colleagues warned him that his vision didn't match the reality of the post. But he went anyway, and just as his friends predicted, his fortune didn't materialize. So he needed a plan B. To live in the style to which he was accustomed, he needed to find a business that would make him some money. Unfortunately, Trist was an exceptionally bad businessman. He had investments in sugar plantations both in Louisiana and in Havana, but he kept getting caught in cash squeezes both from the Biddle Panic and then the deeper panic in 1837. He's always in a position where he and other investors are about to go in. He signs the papers and then those investors have to pull out because of financial uh, collapse. If the secret to comedy is timing, he was very funny economically. He tried to broker new uh, uh, breech-loading U.S.-made weapons to the Spanish authorities. He tried to sell guard dogs. Uh, he tried to sell guinea grass as animal feed. He invested in tropical fruit, especially pineapples, sugar, coffee, tobacco. 
Here's an example of one of the ventures advertised in Washington, D.C.'s National Intelligencer in December 1834. Choice Havana cigars, 20,000 Havana cigars selected from the factories of Cologne and Gutierrez by our consulate Havana, Mr. N.P. Trist, embracing the Trabucos and King cigars, the finest ever offered for sale in this country. He invested in railroad construction and mining concerns. He tried to drum up uh, business for American manufacturers of horseshoes and charcoal furnaces. He wrote a treatise on how to keep tile roofs from leaking, like he was basically going into the roofing business at one point, and none of it worked. By 1837, he's reduced to begging his lawyer to slip newspapers inside one another and bundle them together uh, in one envelope to duck paying the full cost of the postage. After he, he ends his run as consul, you know, late 1848, early 1841, uh, he still has his house. He stays in, in Cuba until 1845, mostly making his living from eking out what he can from the sugar investments, but also taking in borders and having his wife raise a market garden to make ends meet. He's kind of this sort of classic Jacksonian man on the make, except none of it works. It's all disaster. The thing is, pretty much every commercial venture in Havana revolved around, or at least came into contact with, one institution. Slavery. Trist certainly held an interest in enslaved workers through his investments in sugar plantations, but his connections to slavery were more than that. And they put him at odds with not only the merchant communities of New England, but also the abolitionists of Great Britain and the world. After the break, Havana and the slave trade. This week, the voice of Nicholas Trist is read by Craig Bruce Smith. Just like Trist, Craig has a lot to say about honor through his book about the American Revolution, American Honor. The American Revolution was not only a revolution for liberty and freedom, it was also a revolution of ethics, reshaping what colonial Americans understood as honor and virtue. As Craig demonstrates, these concepts were crucial aspects of revolutionary Americans' ideological break from Europe and they were shared by all ranks of society. Craig focuses his study primarily on prominent Americans who came of age before and during the Revolution, by also interweaving individuals and groups that have historically been excluded from the discussion of honor, such as female thinkers, women patriots, slaves, and free African Americans. Craig argues that the Revolutionary Era witnessed a fundamental shift in ethical ideas. You can get Craig's book wherever you get your books, Amazon, bookshop.com, or your local bookstore. Thanks for reading for us, Craig. Now, let's get back to Havana. Remember, Trist desperately needs money. And in Havana, money is tied to slavery. Havana was known for being one of the hotbeds of the transatlantic slave trade in the early 1800s. In other words, when Africans were forcibly brought from their homes in Africa, they often came to Havana before being sold to enslavers across the Caribbean, Latin America, and even the United States. To understand how Havana became fully intertwined with slavery, we have to back up a bit, actually a few hundred years. According to Leonardo Marquez, who studies the transatlantic slave trade during the colonial period, All of the European imperial powers relied on the slave trade. Some, like the Portuguese and the British, took a leading role in supplying the enslaved labor, and others, like the Spanish colony of Cuba, depended on it. The Spanish Empire is actually the empire that mostly depends from other empires for their uh, supply of enslaved Africans. And of course, different powers will take advantage of that Over this entire story, though, during the long 16th century, the Portuguese are pretty much the main suppliers for the Spanish, you know, for Spanish territories. Cuba, of course, is receiving some enslaved Africans from the very beginning. Initially, enslaved people worked in the silver mines of Brazil and elsewhere. But for Cuba... The key change comes with the expansion of sugar production in the 18th century. And that, of course, changes the demand for uh, labor within the island. The structural problem appears once again. So 
Cuban elites uh, are trying to create their own branch of the slave trade. They mostly fail. So they always depend on this uh, supply from the outside. And when, you know, sugar production starts to take off, the British, of course, are the main slave traders in the Atlantic world, along with the Portuguese. But the British are the main ones actually taking advantage of this new opportunity, let's say, right, from the perspective of the slave traders. Cuba is one of the many places that slave ships go, both to provide enslaved workers for the sugar plantations in Cuba and to send enslaved people elsewhere in the world, including the United States. During the American Revolution, all the states technically banned the slave trade, but some reopened it later, and other states seemed to turn a blind eye. At the beginning, Americans could be involved in all phases. American slave ships could be built in American ports. Expeditions to Africa could be financed by American merchants and underwritten by American and British insurance companies. The American crew of the American ship could bring back Africans to Cuba, other places in the Caribbean, and the United States, where American plantation owners could enslave them or sell them. You could say you have a very coherent form of U.S. participation, right? That is very direct and it's very similar to everything we saw over the three or four centuries of the early modern period. And Cuba, of course, is one of the main destinations here. Some of these guys are actually investing in sugar plantations as well. Uh, so, you know, the DeWolf family from Rhode Island, who are the largest slave traders in U.S. history. Uh, and of course, James DeWolf becomes a U.S. senator, one of the richest guys uh, in New England. It starts to invest on Cuban plantations as well. So they are not only seeing the opportunity created as, you know, suppliers of slaves, but also as sugar producers. And a number of New Englanders start to invest uh, on those plantations. But things change in 1808. That year was the first year that it was possible for the United States to officially ban U.S. involvement in the slave trade. Why this year? The date 1808 is literally inscribed in the Constitution. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. To his credit, President Thomas Jefferson signed into law the act abolishing the international slave trade so that it would go into effect the first day that it could, January 1st, 1808. There had been other laws previously passed that attempted to restrict the ways Americans could be involved in the slave trade, but these laws seem to have been largely ignored. The 1808 full ban on the slave trade was a bit different. Leonardo argues that this piece of legislation had a significant impact on the trade, not because Americans stopped being involved, they didn't, but rather because now certain parts of the process were more difficult for Americans to do. Some active participants in the slave trade, like the DeWolf family, did get out of the business after 1808. Many slave traders must have seen the handwriting on the wall, 1807 is the year in which U.S. ships carried more enslaved people than any other year, by a very big margin. In 1808, the number dropped to almost zero. You can see all of this from data in the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. You should really go check this site out at slavevoyages.org. The slave trade is much more complex than we can deal with here in this episode, but this great digital project could really help. Anyway, some Americans found ways to get around the law or indirectly involve themselves in certain aspects of the slave trade while leaving the actual transportation of enslaved people to others. The U.S. really becomes the most powerful producer of ships, right? So U.S. built ships are really outstanding. A lot of the tradition in shipbuilding 
in the United States is developed in the context of wars against the British, right? Not only War of Independence, but the 1812 war. The U.S. ships become, they become notoriously famous for their speed and, of course, their capacity against uh, the British Navy, which is becoming the main opponent of the slave trade, right? So it is, in a sense, uh, almost a natural move, let's say, or a, a logical move for slave traders to actually go after those ships. And they start to appear, I mean, they, they of course, are part of the slave trade as part of this early U.S. branch of the slave trade, right? So U.S. slave traders, by the late 18th, early 19th, are probably the most efficient or one of the most efficient um, slave traders of the Atlantic world, right? They are actually going to the South Atlantic, Mozambique, uh, Rio de la Plata in, in uh, South America, and making profits all over the place, right? And to a large extent, that's possible because they have very uh, fast and efficient ships to use. The number of U.S. ships being used in the slave trade are on the rise right? over the 1810s, 1820s, 1830s. We see this over the first half of the 19th century and beyond, all the way to 1865. The number of U.S. built ships become a mainstay, we could say, of the transatlantic uh, slave trade. Technically, it's against the law for American ships to be used in the slave trade. So the big question is, when does a ship become a slave ship? British legislation also had people calling for and even including articles prohibiting that ships are sold for slave traders. But once you have like the actual sales uh, taking place, it becomes a problem how to actually persecute those individuals. Do they intentionally sold those ships for slave traders? A lot of British authorities, and not necessarily connected to the slave trade in any way, but like defenders of free, free trade, people who actually believed that free trade would just lead to a more pro prosperous uh, reality. A lot of them are arguing that, you know, to uh, try to restrict those kinds of commercial activities would be a destruction of the trade as a whole. Right? You, you can't stop, you can't actually blame shipbuilders, for example, unless you have, uh, you know, a very clear case of, you know, a slave trader making a demand for a specific ship. So actually finding where exactly is the illegal moment becomes a, a challenge. While the slave trade flowed through Havana, the Americans would be involved in some way, whether through ships, crews, or something else. And that brings us back to Nicholas Trist. While Trist was consul in Havana, a British abolitionist named Richard R. Madden wrote an open letter to William Ellery Channing in Boston, accusing Trist of active participation in the slave trade. It has been my good fortune to have been permitted to converse freely and to communicate even familiarly on the subject of this communication with many of the great and good men of this country, of all parties, of all sects, northerners and southerners, and finding greatness of mind and goodness of heart limited to no particular latitudes, I have inquired of all what interest had the United States in promoting the desolation of Africa by affording the inhuman trade in slaves the protection of her flag. And there has been little or any essential difference in the answers I have received. Let me ask you, my dear sir, the same question. And in the name of truth and justice, on behalf of the unfortunate people of Africa, and for the sake of the honour of that flag which will owe its first stain to the infamy of this unhallowed traffic without the promptest interposition, let me conjure you to give to this question a reply prompt and loud that will go through the land, arrest attention at Washington, and find its way to the Havana not only as the voice of the highest wisdom of the country, 
and moreover of public opinion, but as the stern accents of authority that will speak to a functionary who has betrayed his trust in the language of rebuke, henceforth be thou no officer of mine. Madden is more famous for getting involved in another case that originated in Cuba, the case of the Amistad, the Spanish slave ship whose captives mutinied and ended up in prison in the United States. There's a movie about the Amistad. Madden's testimony in that case was all about the status of the slave trade in Cuba. Many of these arguments appear in his letter against Trist as well. Madden laid out all the ways Trist had violated American law and morality by enabling the slave trade, going back at least four years. He specifically called out a number of practices that Trist or someone in the U.S. consular office had used. In each instance, Trist had purportedly used the power of the office of consul to allow illegal activities to continue. These conclusions will be grounded, I presume, on the following assumptions. One, that the Spanish slave trade has gradually and steadily increased from the year 1829 to the present year, and the importations have been augmented from 15,000 to 25,000 per annum. Two, that the great amount of American capital invested in slave property in the island of Cuba and the energy with which the new American settlers have entered on the cultivation of new land, the establishment of new American plantations, averaging during the last three years twenty a year, have largely contributed to give an impetus to the trade, which had been fatal to the efforts made for its suppression. Three, that the recent Treaty of 1835 between Spain and England for its suppression has been successfully evaded by the practice adopted of shipping the stores for the slave trade on board American vessels at the Havana. 4. That American vessels are suffered to proceed with the stores to Africa and even to return to the island of Cuba under the Portuguese flag with the full knowledge of the Consul of the United States. 5. That all the vessels in the Spanish slave trade are built in America, chiefly in Baltimore. And this list goes on for eight more points, building up the case that the illegal slave trade has been funneled through Americans. But for Trist, the last point is the most damning. Exceptions fell into complete disuse. Eleven, that on the dismissal from office of the notorious slave trader Fernandez, the Portuguese consul, Mr. Trist became the acting consul for that nation. 12. That the use and abuse of these two flags were of necessity known to Mr. N. P. Trist and were connived at by him. Okay, this is a long list, so let's break it down a bit. It seems obvious that Madden was trying to indict Americans as a group for their participation in the trade, but he did single out Trist for special censure. Madden alleged that the first way Trist tried to skirt the law was by recertifying enslaved people themselves. In 1836, he said, Trist had declared a cargo of Africans, indentured servants, bound for work in Texas, instead of the slaves that they clearly were. Remember, at this time, Texas isn't a part of the United States yet. It would have been a foreign country. If we can believe Madden's interpretation, Trist did do this sort of recertifying more than once, and he even admitted to it. This wasn't Trist's only run-in with British commissioners in Havana who were there to monitor the slave trade. Madden also accused Trist of being involved in another scheme that was much more wide-ranging and much more serious, recertifying of American vessels as another nationality. Or, as Madden put it, American vessels were going to Africa under the Portuguese flag. But this scheme, Trist adamantly denied any role in. I am not wholly convinced he was directly involved. But you had to be a pure idiot not to see that Havana was being used in uh, what he referred to as flag foolery. 
a kind of flipping of flags. Basically, these vessels were being built and outfitted in Baltimore, sailed down to Havana, sold initially to Spanish, and then after a new treaty between uh, Spain and the UK, then instead to, to Portuguese owners, sailed to Africa, where it would go on blackbirding or, or slaving uh, missions. The other euphemism was gone to Africa for salt. These ships would then come back, be re-registered as American by the consul, and then pass for coastal and therefore legal slave vessels. You know, the argument was, oh no, these are slaves from Virginia being sold to Louisiana. The, the Portuguese flag gave cover for the African part of the trip, and the American flag allowed these new slaves to pass as already American slaves. What Trist's actual role is in this is very hard to to pin down. He is adamant that he's innocent. And his absence, his physical absence for health reasons and for family reasons from his post for long chunks of time make that more plausible than it would otherwise be. When Madden and the commissioners called out Trist for these acts, Trist responded the only way he knew how, with a lot of words. One of his responses to the commissioners came in at 276 pages. Whether Trist was personally involved in these schemes or not, it's pretty clear that he had no intention of cooperating with the commissioners. He personally believed in the legitimacy of slavery. Remember, he's a Virginian who had certainly seen slavery up close in the American South and here in Cuba. And he did often remind everyone of all the arguments for slavery. But his objections to British interference ran deeper than just his personal beliefs. Like many other Americans, he saw a conspiracy against the United States embedded in the British interest in eliminating the slave trade. The conspiracy basically worked like this. The British had always been active participants in the slave trade themselves. When they suddenly wanted to police the slave trade, it wasn't to abolish the trade, but rather to be able to search any ship of any nationality whenever they wanted, if the vessel looked like it was engaged in the slave trade. Many European nations signed treaties giving them this right, in exchange for getting the right to search British vessels themselves. But the United States didn't. This practice is called the right of mutual search. And if you're wondering why the United States, even some abolitionists, rejected it, look no further than the subject of our most recent past episode, impressment. The United States had justifiably objected to British search in the past, and they weren't eager to hand over that right voluntarily. Sure, some objected because they were engaged in the slave trade and they didn't want to get caught. But many objected because they saw it as a violation of the sovereignty of the United States. Once Spain and Great Britain signed a treaty with the right of mutual search in 1835, false flagging took on an even more significant role in the Cuban slave trade. From 1800 to 1835, the majority of slave ships coming through Havana were Spanish. After the treaty, Portuguese and American ships became much more prominent. So the year 1835 had, in fact, marked a turning point in the history of U.S. participation in the slave trade. A treaty between England and Spain that permitted the capture of vessels equipped for the slave trade. After that year, uh, led to the development of new strategies that involved non-Spanish merchants on a whole new level. Before 1835, Let's say that a Spanish ship clearly was prepared to be used in the slave trade, but had no slaves inside, could not be captured. That changes with that provision of 1835. So any ship that is carrying shackles, you know, is clearly prepared to engage in the slave trade, could be captured by the British Navy. And it is at this moment that slave traders... Uh, involved in the slave trade to Cuba, start to use the U.S. flag more openly. Slave traders want to use the American flag because American ships now are some of the few that can't be searched legally. 
And the number of American flagged slave ships goes up by a lot in the later 1830s because of this. So it's not only about the speed anymore, but the speed combined with the protection that the U.S. flag will offer to ships that are being prepared for the slave trade, since the British Navy wouldn't be able to stop them. And of course, that becomes more complicated as well, because if the ship is keeping the U.S. flag, there's got to be some sort of documentation proving that the ship is actually of uh, U.S. nationality. And that's where I would say Trist and a lot of the consular activities, both in Brazil and Cuba, becomes even more important. Because then you have to offer, in some way, documents that will allow those ships to keep their flag. In order to get this documentation, a slave ship captain needed a man on the inside. And that's what Madden accused Trist of being. We've already seen how he could recertify ships as Portuguese when they arrived in Havana, but it seems likely that he also made it possible for slave ships to hold both American and Portuguese documents and flags for the whole voyage. Then, if a slave ship were sighted by a British naval vessel, it could haul up the American flag and deny the right of search. Once the ship was gone, it could put up the Portuguese flag so that it would be welcomed back into Havana or ports in Brazil. Trist could accomplish this in part because for a while he was both the American and the Portuguese consul in Havana, and thus he had access to all the paperwork for both nations. So when the British commissioners started looking into these false flagships, Trist was right in the center of the whole mess. One of the reasons that he is the target of these accusations is very oddly, he was also the Portuguese consul at Havana. The Portuguese, in part because of what had been going on with reflagging ships as Portuguese, their consul, a guy named uh, Senor Fernandez, gets kicked out, gets recalled to Lisbon, and there's, there's a gap. There's nobody to fill in as the Portuguese consul. And so it's unusual that it happened in some place as, as central and important as Havana, but in far-flung ports, often you had somebody serving as the consul to two or even more Uh, nations just by virtue of there's nobody else to do the job. So let's review. Richard R. Madden accused Trist of facilitating the slave trade in two ways. Number one, by reclassifying enslaved people as indentured servants. Number two, by recertifying vessels as American or as Portuguese, depending on the need of the vessel, in order to cover up their participation in the slave trade. As Leonardo and Matt have explained, false flagging could be useful for both voyages from Cuba to Africa and from Cuba to the United States. Okay, but remember, Matt doesn't think Trist is guilty of these charges. So if he isn't, then who is? Some of them blame a young 19-year-old he hires to work in the consul's office, a guy named Peter Crusoe who was born in Gibraltar, raised in Brazil, and can work fluently in several languages, including English and Portuguese and Spanish. Crusoe seems to have been the real nub and the one who was really using the consul's office to do this. How complicit or how aware Trist was is an open question. I do know that he kept paying Crusoe's rent after he fired him for more than a year. So, um, you know, that is perhaps circumstantial, but significant. Now, if you're feeling a little bit of cognitive dissonance right now, you're not alone. I honestly have a hard time wrapping my head around Trist's character and actions. On the one hand, there's no question that in his dealings with American sea captains mistreating their sailors, he went to bat for the common sailor time after time. Yet, when the opportunity arises to help enslavers keep the slave trade alive, putting Africans into far worse condition than any of those sailors he helped, he doesn't see it the same way. While Trist was consul in Havana, over 41,000 Africans entered the port of Havana, either to be sold elsewhere or to work the plantations in Cuba. Whether he actually was personally involved in their transportation or not, he certainly had no moral compunction against slavery, 
The one thing that makes it seem even the tiniest bit possible that he isn't personally involved in the slave trade is his dedication to the rule of law. Even he, I think, would argue, at least in public, right, that while slavery is excellent and terrific and ultimately the thing that makes American democracy possible, he's very much a a Jeffersonian and very devoted to Jefferson personally and also to Jackson, right, very much a believer in that kind of heron volk democracy that the equality of white men of all rank is made possible by the inequality of race. And so, you know, he's indisputably a racist um, and pro-slavery, but he would at least insist he is not in favor of the illegal post-1808 African slave trade. In the end, Congress cleared Trist of any participation in the slave trade. His fights with the American captains who came through Havana were what finally did him in. Perhaps the Charleston Mercury summed it up the best. It is possible that the statements respecting him may be in some degree exaggerated, and if the opportunity were allowed him, he might be able to palliate, if not altogether justify, his conduct. However this may be, it is obvious enough that he is hated by the Americans of Havana, who have no confidence in his wisdom or his goodness, that his continuance in office must be detrimental to the interests of individuals and the honor of the country, and the sooner he is disgracefully expelled, from the position he thus disgracefully fills, the better. He's sort of recalled after much scandal and much drama. There's a 475-page congressional report that just ends with the Commerce Committee saying, can we please stop talking about this? That involves him throwing an American captain in a Cuban jail. It's interestingly, he gets, at least domestically, in way more trouble for being rude to merchants and captains than he ever does for possibly engaging in an international crime syndicate to to further slavery. But um, he loses his appointment after the election in 1840. You know, there's no way he's going to survive a, a, a Whig administration. And he even writes sort of begging to be let out of his position as consul and argues that he can do more good for the U.S. as a free agent in Havana where he can report to the president and, you know, speak his mind. Trist was 41 years old when he officially stepped down in 1841 after eight years as U.S. consul. A few years later, Trist negotiated the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, a feat for which he not only didn't receive praise but actually received censure. The claims he made on the government for his work in Mexico weren't paid out until 1871, nearly 25 years after the negotiation. In this venture, too, Trist's high hopes for success were disappointed. Constellation Prize is a podcast of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. This episode was produced by Abby Mullen and me, Chris Denson, and edited by Brenna Riley. Fact-checking is by Deepthi Murley. Music is by Andrew Cody. Special thanks to our experts, Matthew Rafferty and Leonardo Marquez. You can find out more about them in our show notes at constellationprize.rrchnm.org. Our voices this week were Craig Bruce Smith, Jessica Otis, Mark Gladwell, and Doug Garland. Please go like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast, and please tell your friends. Thanks for listening.